Hi, I'm Michael Leifman of Tenley Consulting. And I am Marco Nunziata of Anunciata and Design Advisors. Welcome to M4 Edge, the podcast about technologies that can change how our economy functions. There is arguably nothing more important to our future economy than the quality of our education system. And there is nothing more important to that than the quality and availability of teachers. But as anyone who's followed the news in the last couple of years knows, we are currently facing something of a crisis in the availability of qualified teachers. Here are some stats to put that crisis into perspective. According to EdWeek, there are over 3.1 million full-time equivalent teachers in public schools in the fall of 2022. So that's our starting place, 3.1 million FTE teachers. But the National Education Association estimates that there is a shortage of roughly 300,000 teachers in public schools. So 10% of needed teachers are missing. We should have 3.4 million. But in fact, the number of full-time, not full-time equivalent teachers is less than 3.1 million. That FT, full-time equivalent number, includes aides and part-time teachers. So in fact, missing 300,000 may be more like missing 20% of full-time teachers. According to EdWeek, again, there are nearly 50 million students in public schools across the country. So using the teacher to student, student ratio of 50 million students and 3.4 million teachers, that works out to just under about 15 kids per teacher. So if we're missing 300,000 teachers, that works out to about four and a half million kids without sufficient teacher-led instruction. That's a lot of numbers. So we hope we you paid attention when you were in school. There will so be a quiz. Absorbing this. We know that historically, the low pay of teachers relative to other fields that require high levels of education has meant that we should not expect an overabundance of labor in the teacher workforce. Without a major shift in education policy, there is not much that can change on the demand side that is in the school system to attract much more supply. But our guest today has come up with not one, but two initiatives. One to help increase the supply of trained teachers and the other to remove friction in the system so supply can better meet demand. She has an MBA, but also a PhD. And her dissertation was about labor supply and Teach for America. She's taught in the classroom and founded charter schools. She is the chancellor of Reach University and the CEO of Craft Education Systems, Mallory dwinnell Palish. Welcome to M4Edge. Hi there. It's so nice to be here. Mallory, very welcome to our show. And let's start with what these two organizations are. Tell us, what is REACH, what is CRAFT, and what problem is each one solving? Let's do REACH first. Sure. So REACH University is a regionally accredited nonprofit university that does exactly one thing, and that is stackable apprenticeship-based degrees in the teaching profession. So the idea there being that we start in partnership with school districts that have teacher shortages, help them identify untapped talent in their local labor market, and then create pathways for the, the jobs that already exist in those schools to become accredited apprenticeships that confer a college degree and then prepare the completers to earn their teaching credential and become a teacher in the classroom. Excellent. Do you want to tell us a little bit about craft first? We've got, we've got questions on, on both of those. And so if you want to give us the elevator pitch on craft too, and then we'll start in with some, uh, some more detailed questions. That sounds great. And so craft, I think the best way to explain what craft is, is to talk about what was the big challenge we ran into when we started reach, Mm. which was that most universities already have their hands full with all of the data reporting required for accreditation, accreditors with our state credentialing boards for teaching, et cetera. And then on the other end of the spectrum, there are apprenticeships. Those used to be only for professional electrician, plumber, et cetera, had their own completely separate data system and reporting requirements. And none of that, because those were professions that didn't require a college degree, is in alignment with the data requirements of degree accreditation. And so Craft rose in response to that as we call it our TurboTax for apprenticeship degree reporting. Basically, a very boring problem that shouldn't exist in the first place, which is Craft goes in and makes sure that there is data alignment that one set of data can report to both the Department of Ed and the Department of Labor so that universities can offer these degrees. 
Perfect. Okay, great. Thank you for that. So back to REACH. So the REACH website lists some of the organization's beliefs. And I want to talk about a few of them, starting with the belief, the quote here is, job embedded learning generates exceptional outcomes by integrating theory and practice and by expanding equity and access. So theory and practice, equity and access. So tell us what that means in practice. Sure, absolutely. Um, so let's start with the theory and practice and, and the quality piece, and then we'll get to equity and access. Yeah. So on, on that first side, I think there's a misconception that the more esoteric something is, the higher quality academically it must be in higher education. Just, right? just the look more, at economics dissertations. <laughs> and thank you very much, including my own, right? The more you can throw jargon in there, the more you can make it removed from something that the average person reading it can understand, the better it must be. And it's funny because I started my career as a teacher. My husband works as an emergency room doctor. And for both of us in our respective professions, no one wanted to hire me as a first year teacher. No one wanted that person because I wasn't going to be very good. I wasn't going to have strong quality on my first day because it was completely removed from practice. And then my husband going into medicine could not legally do that. He had to complete a medical residency pathway, a four-year apprenticeship, basically, before they would let him be a practitioner after he had four years of medical school and four years of college, because they knew that theory and practice have to be blended together for someone to become a quality provider. So the first end of this spectrum is when we talk about quality teachers and when we talk about apprenticeship degrees, we are not talking about lowering the standard of what it takes of the quality we want in our educators, quite the contrary. We want all of our educators to enter the workforce on day one with the practitioner skill set, that means that they can't just be living in theory until they complete their degree. That's the equality side from theory and practice being integrated. Equity and access is also a quality play, right? So we could talk about it from a workforce and labor perspective of is it fair to people that if I don't come from a background where I can afford four years out of the workforce, if I can afford student loan debt, unless those things are true, I can't access this profession. That's an important conversation. To be honest, it is trumped for me by the argument of kids need the best educators in the classroom. I don't really care about what's fair to teaching candidates. I care about what's fair for kids. And when it comes to equity and access, the answer is the same. There is significant empirical, empirical evidence that students learn best when they are taught by people who shared their lived experiences, who share their racial identity and background. And yet right now, where the majority of our students in the United States are non-white, coming from low-income backgrounds where they're eligible for free and reduced lunch, that's our student body, 80% of our educators are white women, middle class, some intersection of those three things. And so there is this, when we talk about the quality of our educators, it actually is also a question of who are our educators. And because of the way we've set up these pathways, there is a massive mismatch in the demographics between our students and our teachers. So on both ends, both theory plus practice and equity and access, we believe apprenticeship degrees are a solution and that it's a solution that drives towards our bottom line, which is quality educators in every classroom. Okay, so there are two things here, Mallory, that make me very, very excited in a, in a good way. The, the first one is I actually want to reiterate something that you mentioned because I think it's extremely important. So with the example of uh, your experience and your husband's experience, the importance of education, normally when we talk about uh, the importance or the value of a degree, for entering certain profession. Some of the emphasis has been on the idea that perhaps for some professions, having a, a four-year college degree or a certain level of edu education is not necessary, it's too much. But you actually, with your personal example, made a very different point, which is that often we launch into these long paths of education. And then it's not that what you get is too much. It's not enough. It's missing the crucial ingredients that are needed to immediately enter the workplace in some fundamental areas like education and health. This is a very powerful point that I don't think it's enough well known and enough understood. I completely agree, which obviously I'm biased, but I, I completely agree, which is that you know, there, there are two debates going on in the world right now. And I think it's important that we disentangle them, right? The first one is this debate of do all of the jobs that require a college degree need them? And that's a debate that is really important. It's not really the debate that we are a part of, right? The we are looking at the sectors of the labor market, like teaching, nursing, 
energy and advanced manufacturing. And these are professions that require a a, a more advanced body of knowledge than I would be comfortable having someone be a practitioner without a college degree. I do not want a nurse who has not gone to college. I do not want a teacher for my children who has not gone to college. So we are in this separate question in the labor market, which is let's take as a given that some of these professions do require a college degree. How do we make that degree accessible without compromising on quality? And that's, that is the part where we're focused. And let, let's go back. Sorry, Michael. I just want to go to go back. The uh, besides, I love in, a chance to interrupt Michael. So. <laughs> but I, I wanted to, to go back quickly to the the second point you had made. The point about equity and the, the point you made, Mallory, was it's proven that for children it's beneficial to have at least some teachers who have their same experience, and yet. Uh, there is a, an increasing divergence between the racial and income makeup of teachers on one hand and children, students on the others. Do you want to elaborate a bit on one, why that has been happening, and two, how your solutions, how Craft and Reach can address that? Sure. Yeah. So in terms of how we got here, that we're seeing this divergence in our labor market and the students they're serving, it comes down to a a ton of social systems playing out the way they were going to play out. And so one, I think our socioeconomic systems, objectively, it's, it's not a normative statement. It's not a question of if you believe it or not. It is an objective fact that we are seeing ex- we increasing inequality over time in terms of wage spread in the United States. So that's the socioeconomic piece. Over 50% of our students in our K-12 system now qualify for free and reduced lunch. We have never been at that place in history before. And there are myriad economic systems that have led to that, whether it's the weakening of the social safety net, um, the, the spread of wages over time between management positions and non-management. There are a significant number of things that have led to that socioeconomic piece. On a sociological piece, we're also seeing a diversification of the United States population from a racial demographic profile. Again, we are seeing more students that are, it used to be that overwhelmingly the students in our school system were white. And now we are seeing a dramatic increase in the number of Latino students that we are serving. Uh, We are seeing an overall diversification of students of color in our system. And so, so those forces are taking place in society and then trickle into our schools. Our students are becoming more diverse. And what we are seeing is that the teaching has not mirrored those changes. And I, and I believe that is largely because of the fact that there is still so much latent privilege to access our college systems and to earn a college degree. I have to be able to afford college. I have to be able to afford the opportunity cost of being out of the workforce. I then have to professional network to go find a teaching degree or a teaching position in the exact subject level and subject area and grade level that I need requires all of those things create a sieve that slowly sorts people out. And see on the other end is people who came from backgrounds where their family had companies and knew how to access the system, had financial resources and support able to support them. Those are the people who make it through the college gauntlet and become teachers. And it is not reflective of society, which is then what our student body looks like. By the way, you might have missed that cue, listeners, that Mallory said opportunity costs. And so in our early conversation, I think she used the word monopsony a couple of times. It was like, you had me at monopsony. So we've got a very <laughs> well-educated economist as our, as our guest here. You know, one of the things, one of the beliefs that I wasn't going to talk about, but we sort of went down this path uh, just a few minutes ago was the belief on efficiency of education. And Marco was alluding to this a little bit, I think, in that c- the common path for teachers in the United States is to go to a liberal arts college and then to get a degree that leads them to teaching. Either it's an education degree or a teaching degree, or they get a master's in education or in teaching, but it's this liberal arts college that's in the middle. And um, I'm a proponent of liberal arts study, actually, though it's not the it's not the normal model in Europe and in many other parts of the world. And I mean, do you think that there's a price for efficiency, right? There's there's a price for learning only one one specific thing. And I'm wondering if you have thoughts on that. I know that with an apprenticeship model, um, it sort of has to be efficient because they're working at the same time. But in the broader sense, do you think that the liberal arts model is playing a, a bad role in the in the job market here? Not at all. I'm a huge proponent of liberal arts. And in fact, um, Reach University, our undergraduate 
division is called the Oxford Teachers College because we developed our degree in partnership with faculty at the University of Oxford around the sort of liberal arts tutorial model. And I think there is, there's a false binary that pops up of technical or liberal arts when it comes to education. And so to talk about how we do it at Reach University, people actually graduate from our institution with a degree in liberal studies Hmm. and then a credential specific to their subject area. And for that to be the case, all of our students, it does not matter if you're going to become a middle school English teacher, you have to go through our math sequence. It does not matter if you're going to become a high school history teacher, you have to go through our STEM and science pathway. Hmm. Um, We think that it is very important for teachers to learn not just their content and not just the pedagogy of their content, but perhaps most important, how to think, to have a rigorous framework for how I approach a problem and how I solve that. And I remain convinced that liberal arts is far and away the best tool that we have for that. I, I, and, and liberal arts is inefficient, to be clear. But, but learning how to think is an inefficient process. It's just a question of if it's worth the return on investment. And I would argue every time that it is. And so the question for us is not technical versus liberal arts. It's let's take liberal arts and make sure that it is still threaded into the workforce. Just because your liberal arts doesn't give you the argument that it is somehow higher quality liberal arts, if it is less attached to the real world where you'll be applying it afterwards. Mm -hmm. So, So our argument is make it liberal arts, but also give students the opportunity to practice what they're learning in this liberal arts framework every day so that they have those reps and that exposure with metacognitive processing as they enter the workforce. Okay, there are two points here, Mallory, that I would like to to clarify because I think they're fascinating and important. One is the issue of how do we interpret the concept of liberal arts, right? And you seem to take, which I agree with, a, a broader context, which almost brings us back to the origins of education, back to ancient Greek, where liberal arts means the entirety of education and the broader approach to human knowledge. So it spans uh, philosophy, literature, and math and physics on the other extreme. There has to be a component of, of all of it. But together, parallel to this, there is also the issue of to what extent should education be based on uh, high-level thinking, and to what extent should it be channeled towards more practical skills, right? That, which is important both in terms maybe less for teachers, because teachers have to be able to grasp the entirety of the knowledge and transmit it, but also in terms of how the teachers then teach and direct the students into different career paths. You want to talk a bit about, about that as well? Yes. So so first, I think a really important foundational question to ask ourselves is, what is the purpose of education? And because if we don't know the purpose of a K-12 system, it's very hard for us to know if our teachers are executing against that purpose. And in some ways, that question is a trap, because if I were to ask 50 different people, what's the purpose of education? I would get 51 different answers, right? No one, no, no one really can agree on what the purpose of education is, even with themselves. And I think we saw that during the pandemic, right? We realized during the, the pandemic that actually there's this huge component of education that is child care, that is making sure that teenagers are safe during the day, uh, that is mental health. And then on top of that, then there is education and academic content. And then there is civic instruction and teaching students how to be citizens. And so the fact of the matter is education is probably supposed to be some version of all of those things. And then you layer on top of that, to your point, Marco, teachers are also supposed to be career advisors that help students find their passions and enter into the right workforce. All of that suggests to me the fact that there isn't a singular purpose of what teaching is and what it is supposed to be to do it well, all supports for me the thesis that what we need are educators who have, yes, depth in their particular subject area, but also breadth in terms of their understanding of the intersection, not just between other subject areas, not just I'm the biology teacher and I understand how that relates to the physics teacher or the English teacher's work, but also who understand their positioning of As I go in and teach this student every day, implicitly, I am also a caregiver. I am also someone who is teaching them about civic obligation and engagement. That requires a breadth and a a liberal arts foundation. So I think that unless we decide to forego all of the other purposes of education and say the sole purpose of education is content mastery in your specific domain, we cannot 
we, we just, it would be completely incongruent to give up on the liberal arts foundation. Right. It's a good, it's a good segue actually to our next question. Marco, do you want to take it or you want me to, to run with this one? Go for it. So Mallory, this being M4 Edge, one of the beliefs that really caught our eye uh, were around technology and innovation. Um, and so I'll read this one again for our audience. The technology belief is technology must make education more student-centered, affordable, accessible, convenient, and effective. So what makes technology student-centered? What are, what are some examples of technologies that maybe are not student-centered? Yeah, I think... Um... The big paradox here is that a lot of times technology tries to be student centered by competing with the teacher or the educator to have the student's attention and with the idea of that is somehow student centered. But implicitly, I would argue that's not right. When, when we say student centered, what we really mean is education is a human interpersonal experience. And if you take a look at the 10,000 things that need to happen for a student to learn, there's no way that one teacher can do all 10,000 of those things. So for us, the question is, how can technology serve almost as an exoskeleton to the teacher and, and take off some of the duties and obligations, give them that sort of superpower and, and automate the things away that a human doesn't need to do so that it frees up the humans in our system, our students and our teachers to really have that, that focused, personalized experience. I want my teacher focused on the student's needs and not on the report that they have to send out at the end of the week to, to all of the data collection agencies. And so that's how we think about technology. As just one example, even beyond craft, we have student service student service advisors who provide something that we call intrusive student services, which is that our student service counselors do not wait until a student has dropped out to reach out to the student and find out. They're constantly watching for early signs. Have you missed some homework assignments? Have you not been present in class? Has there been a change in your participation level? For someone to scroll all of that data and to do that analysis manually means that they're spending 30 hours a week just looking at the spreadsheet and then only have 10 hours left to actually reach out to the students. When we put a technology service, we use a great service called Ribbon, which I would recommend to anyone. And when our, when our advisors use that, now suddenly they need about half as much time, a fraction of the time to pull those reports hmm. and it frees up more of their time to actually meet with the students, have meaningful conversations and do the follow-up. So when we talk about technology driving student-centered learning, it doesn't necessarily mean that the student is experiencing the technology. It means the student is experiencing the adults because the adults have the bandwidth because of the technology. Mallory, I have to say you have just achieved the impossible, which is you have mentioned automation without Michael freaking out and starting to scream. Especially, <laughs> it's because I had to put, go on mute. You know, there's some fire engines in the background. So, you know. <laughs> in, in this context, that, that, that is quite impressive. And what? Mallory, I, I promise we're going to turn to craft in a minute, but let, let's stay on reach a bit more. One of the things we really like about the way reach is built is that it's evident there is a ton of intentionality in the program design. The beliefs that Michael has been quoting are part of that, but you also have developed a specific, a specific reach method, which includes efficiency, flexibility, relevance, affordability, and professional capital. All of these elements in different ways lower the marginal cost of supply of teachers by lowering the structural and the financial barriers to getting accredited without lowering the standards, as you have emphasized. Tell us a bit about the last one, professional capital, which to me is one of the most directly addressing the supply and demand disconnect. Absolutely. So, yep. So we have five founding pillars of what an apprenticeship degree is. And the fifth one, which also happens to be one of my top two favorites, uh, is professional capital. And I guess I'd back up and say this. There is immense need for labor market coordination when we talk about teachers. So right now in the United States, there are somewhere between nine and 11 million people who hold active teaching credentials, even though, like you mentioned at the beginning of this, there's only about 3.1 million FTE positions in the United States. So how can it be that we have nearly three to four people holding a teaching credential for every single teaching position in the United States? And at the same time, we have 10% vacancy rates spread across all 50 states. Right? How is that possible? And the answer is because we've been having supply operate in a vacuum completely independent of demand. Teacher labor markets 
are hyper localized, right? So first think about the fact that a school in rural Idaho is done no good by there being a spare teacher that can't get hired somewhere out in Southeast Florida, right? That that does not do them any good. Teachers need to be in the exact geography, in the exact grade level and subject area required for every single classroom in America for this market to clear. And then you layer on top of that, that the overwhelming majority of teachers teach within 50 miles of where they grew up and or went to school. And so we have both a demand that's hyper-localized and a supply that's hyper-localized. And unless we coordinate on that level, we'll end up in the result where we are today, right? That, that's how we got to this seemingly impossible outcome that we can have three times as many people holding credentials as possible and still have every one in 10 positions unfilled. How do we fix that? For us, it comes back to professional capital. So the way our model works, we're a B2B institution. So an individual cannot just come sign up for us and say, I want to be a teacher. We partner with school districts and then school districts tell us two things. Thing one, these are my vacancies both now and what I project over the next five years. Thing two, these are the people already working in my building in a role as a classroom aide, as a tutor, as a paraprofessional who I know could be great teachers for these particular roles, but they need they need the degree. And then we upskill those professionals. And what that means is that the student knows and the district knows that when this person graduates, there is an exact position waiting for them in mind. So we start with that labor coordination at the beginning so that there are no surprises at the end. You know, this, this uh, stat that you mentioned of... Um people teaching within 50 miles of their of where they themselves went to school and grew up. I think that labor mobility is a big issue generally, right? It's not just within education. And I'm wondering if you think there's something particular about teaching that makes labor mobility more difficult or more constrained in some way. Yes, um, I do. So I think first, uh, there's what is the nature of this labor market? Like, how is it dictated? And then what does that mean in terms of who opts into that profession? So I'm going to come back to monopsonies here for a minute. Excellent. Um, <laughs> teacher labor markets, they are, they're not just monopsonies, right? A monopsony is when you have a single buyer of labor. They are monopsonies that are government run, right? A government run monopsony where the pay scale is being set from a single buyer who happens to be a local government institution. I can't think of a less competitive market than that. And the net result is that our teacher wages are way off from what market rate would suggest, right? When we take a look at what usually accountants and nurses are the two comp professions when we talk about teaching in terms of level of degree, level of daily responsibilities, and the labor return for a teacher versus those other professions is way off. So we have ourselves in a situation where the pay rate is way less than what it should be. And so how have we compensated? Largely with non-pecuniary incentives. We'll give you summers off. We'll make sure you're off the same time as your kids. You'll be home every day by 4 p.m. Those are sort of the ways in which we have made the market clear when we weren't able to afford through just competitive wage rates, the people we needed. So now let's think about who's self-selecting into that profession, right? Who are the people that are opting into something that is supposed to be good for having children, having work-life balance, even if it doesn't pay that well? These are the second breadwinners in households, right? These are people who are by and large, not categorically, but by and large, the people who become lifetime teachers are overwhelmingly women, they're overwhelmingly mothers, and they tend to be the second breadwinner in their household. So going back to your question, Michael, is that person going to be the one who gets her whole family to uproot and move across the country because there's a job opening for $45,000, 2000 miles away? Absolutely not. So we've, we have made a profession that only draws in localized talent, but then we have not built a labor market that coordinates around localized talent. I wonder if there's a natural experiment anywhere. Is there part of the United States where actually private schools outnumber public schools and are, you know, what, what are the teacher salaries there like? Does that, well, does that exist anywhere? Well, the problem is private schools tend to pay less than, uh, than public schools. And the reason for that, so, so maybe it's not the government component of this monopsony. Yeah. Uh, maybe it's just the monopsony. The thing about these private schools is they tend to pay less because they tend to have more flexibility. You don't necessarily have to work with students with the same special education needs. You have more flexibility in what you teach. And so we don't see, again, we see these sectors clearing on non-pecuniary incentives as opposed to financial incentives. 
But the problem with that is that non-pecuniary incentives don't typically lead to a labor market that's hyperfluid. Right. Mallory, I'll mention this just in passing, but I thought you had promised us to show up with a cat. That I don't. I'm wondering what happened to the cat. <laughs> you, you might have heard her meowing outside. She's mad because she's been locked out, so she's she's out there and furious. <laughs> I think that, I think that, that that is unfair, and I seem to like it. Just one one last point on the the last issues we were discussing, because uh, implicitly. If I'm not mistaken in what you're telling us, there is also a, not a judgment, but a statement of, or an assessment of the success or failure of the remote learning experiences we've had with the pandemic, right? Because I think of the issue of local supply and local demand you were mentioning in other areas of the economy that has been sold through global supply chains and essentially you outsource. We've carried out an experiment in this through remote learning during the pandemic. Can that not be the solution to matching supply and demand? Of, help me understand of again. students and teachers. So if you have a locality where there is great, there are more students than available teachers, can that not be bridged by having more remote learning? So in theory, yes. Although what the pandemic taught us is that the difference between theory and practice is wide. Um, and, and the reason for that is going back again to what's the purpose of education, right? So the pandemic came around and schools had to shut down and, and learning had to start happening online. So in theory, we should have seen the doors open wide on that. Two years later, here's what we've seen, is that there are, there are two problems, one of which is an artificial shock or artificial challenge. And the second one, which is just an underlying challenge of what an education is. Um, the first one is credentialing requirements. So if I am in the state of California, I have to hire a teacher with a California teaching credential to teach in my school. So if someone is living in Louisiana, in theory, they can work for me, but only if they have a California teaching credential, which they probably don't. That's an artificial issue. That's one that if the second problem weren't the case, we could probably set about trying to solve. Um, and maybe we should regardless. But the second issue is that, again, what we saw during the pandemic is that student learning outcomes plummeted, right? A few weeks ago, uh, we saw the NAEP results, National Assessment for Educational Progress, and student scores in math and reading fell to their lowest in 30 years during the course of that pandemic. Two years was enough to undo 30 years of good teaching progress. And the question is why, right? Some of it is that it's hard to teach online, especially if you've got younger grades. Part of it is that teachers play this role that is not just pedagogical. It is making sure as a school that the student is there every time, that they're sitting in their classroom, that if there seems like there's mental health issues, that they're getting referred to the right place. And when that, the ability to do that was taken away because there's physical distance created, we saw the bottom line on student scores just really fall out. And so, so yes, in theory, online learning can create um, opportunities for there to be a more liquid labor market. And we're seeing some groups do good innovation work around that. Uh, but in practice, what we're realizing is you can get rid of the job, right, of the role, but you can't get rid of the actual task that needs to be done. If we're going to have teachers teaching online, then we need to unbundle that teaching role from those other functions and have someone else on the school site doing it. And we haven't necessarily found that staffing model yet. Got it. So let's turn to Craft now, Craft Education Systems, which is your for-profit startup company. So you're collecting and aggregating data for schools to make hiring easy. What data are you collecting and why don't schools already have it? Yeah. So this comes back to, again, the fact that we have two completely different reporting systems for how we train our teachers. I can't become a teacher until I have my college degree and my teaching credential. And if I'm going to go through a traditional college degree, great. I can use existing systems and data layers that have already been out there. But if I'm going to go through an apprenticeship degree, which for all of the reasons we've discussed that, you know, that creates better practitioner experience, it creates more equi equity and access. Um, if that's a pathway that we want to open up to more students, there isn't a good data layer for reporting on that subsegment that we hope will become a growing part of the workforce because of the fact that now my data needs to be in compliance with the Department of Labor's apprenticeship reporting requirements and the Department of Education's higher education accreditation reporting requirements. And so we have two data systems 
um, that one is imperial, one is metric, and the two don't talk to each other at all because they didn't have to, right? Until recently, apprenticeships were for positions like electrician and plumber, super important, super technical, do not require a college degree. So there was never any need for that compliance. Um, and now as we merge those worlds together, we're finding the rift between those data systems is vast. Michael, as I keep saying, government is the problem. Government is always the problem. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, this is super interesting, Mallory. Let me ask you something, though. Always on this issue of credentials and the data, what is there that the craft can do and that other similar web-based, well, not similar to craft, but other web-based job boards like Indeed or LinkedIn, which are also focused to some extent, though in a different way, on uh, collecting and making public and available and sharing data on credentials and skills and abilities do. What is the crucial difference here? Sure. So there are, the crucial difference actually starts before we ever get to the job board, which is Indeed and LinkedIn and these others don't manage the data compliance for the training itself, right? They they are, I'm an individual, I have gotten my degree and here I can post it. So because they don't do any of that, our first value proposition is actually the value proposition to the training institutions. We will manage that compliance for you so that you can focus on running a great apprenticeship teaching degree and not on manually converting all of that data. That's difference one. The second difference gets back to your question of, okay, so now we've collected and reported all of that data now, the big difference is that we have verified data that students can take with them in a learning and employment record that confirms that they actually did what they said they were doing, right? I think the big problem on Indeed or LinkedIn is if someone's just completely making it up, there's no real way to verify that. If we're already collecting this data with a level of certainty that it can be reported to the U.S. Department of Labor and Department of Government for Federal or Department of Education for federal funds, it has been verified. It is real data. And now an individual student can take that with them and the employer can have some certainty as to the veracity of what they're sharing. It's a very good point. I've always had my doubts about Michael's LinkedIn profile. I, I was going to make the exact same <laughs> joke about you. I said, I was going to say, for example, Marco claims he's an economist, but <laughs> clearly too smart for that. <laughs> so w w what kinds of school districts are using craft? Are these districts with a especially acute staffing problem? Or are they trying to stave off a staffing problem? Um, you know, are, are these the ones in trouble or the ones that think they're going to face trouble? Is there a, a demographic uh, attribute or a district size? You know, what is there a pattern to who's who are your customers? So we started out focused on hyper remote rural regions. That was where mm -hmm. we started because these had, these were groups that if they could not grow their own labor supply, the likelihood of them attracting teachers in felt very low. What we've seen over time, however, is that this demand is universal. For, for schools, at the end of the day, education is not a technology business. Education is a labor business. You are no better as a school than the people you have in your building. So, so even the wealthiest, highest performing districts are constantly worried about when it comes time to hire this next teacher, how do I make sure I have a teacher that is up to my standards, that is steeped in the culture and the practices of my organization? And craft is a data tool for anyone that wants to grow their own teacher labor supply, whether you're remote, rural, urban, wealthy, low income, anywhere in between. If you are trying to grow your own labor, you need this compliance reporting tool, which means you need something like craft. And we are seeing that that appetite and that demand because labor is is such a critical component of a school's success, is has pretty universal appeal. Got it. You want to give us one specific success story? Because it sounds like the so I'm sold that it sounds like what you can offer to school districts, especially rural school districts, districts which are feeling this problem especially acutely. It sounds like it's a pretty unique offering. Give us a success story, like a school or a district that has avoided the major shortage because of the offering that you provide. Sure. So we work with um, a school district in rural Louisiana that is out in the bayous, right out past the, the mainland. And ever since they used to have a ferry that connected them to the mainland, hmm. uh, but the ferry was destroyed during a natural disaster. 
And so now there is really, except for by a private boat that once a day comes and goes, there is no way for people from outside of that bayou to get in, into that place. So as you might imagine, it is almost impossible for them to recruit outside teachers. They had over 90% of their classrooms filled with uncredentialed adults. They had an adult in the building because you can't just have a bunch of 16 year olds running around unchecked. That's terrifying. If anyone's read Lord of the Flies, we know exactly what that looks like. <laughs> but they also only, only about one in 10 of their teachers had a teaching credential that was appropriate for the classroom and the grade level they were supposed to be in. And so that was this huge challenge for this district because they're committed to quality. It's not just that they wanted the paper, they wanted the students to have the quality and the experience and the training that that piece of paper was supposed to confer. And so they have been able to send all of those adults who are already working in that building and already have a good foundation and are from their community through this program. And so now they are in a world where they're about a year or two away, but they're only a few years away from being in a world where 100% instead of 10% of their teachers hold the degree and credential necessary for them to, to teach their students. Hmm, that's great. And I think it's just an example, I should just say, of like, we think the ecosystem is wide. There are so many other tools beyond apprenticeship degrees that can be used. But when you get out into these corner point solutions, something short, like something that is less mobile, something that is less place-based, they hadn't been able to touch their teacher shortage in years. And it, that is what it takes. It takes something with that level of flexibility in those extreme cases. It's a very impressive and powerful story. It's almost a, a segue to a point I want to raise because you know we've discussed this offline and it went completely against my prejudice. One of my <laughs> long-standing prejudices is that one of the reasons why the school system runs into problems is the teachers' unions. And I would have expected that teachers' unions being focused on protecting the interests of their constituencies or current teachers would react defensively to an offering like yours, which brings more people into the profession through a different pathways. But you told us offline that that, that is not the case. Tell us why. Yeah, we've seen um, unions have actually been some of our greatest supporters for helping us get uh, people into the program and trained. And I think the reason for that is teachers unions are filled with teachers who are working in schools every day and feel the burn of being in a building where they're not appropriately staffed. It is not good for me as an English teacher to know that if I'm teaching eighth grade English, that I'm going to get students who didn't have an English teacher in sixth or seventh grade. I don't want that for my students. I don't want that for my classroom. And so they want solutions. By and large, what we've seen is unions are opposed to solutions that they perceive a shortcut in quality, right? I'm going to have you go through a five-week boot camp. I'm going to waive teaching credentials. I'm going to waive other requirements. And, and you can argue whether they should feel that way or not. But at the end of the day, that's the objection we're seeing is not more teachers. It's, are we lowering the barriers that I had to clear to become a teacher? And do I think that is going to have a negative impact on the quality of my colleagues? This pathway, because we are saying, look, the finish line is they're going to have the exact same college degree. They're going to have the exact same teaching credential. We're, we're not removing barriers we're, or we're not removing those safeguards. What we're doing is actually taking existing union members of your sister union, of the classified staff, right? People who are working as paraprofessionals, as classroom aides, they're in the classified union. They're now going to get as a function of their union membership, a free college degree. And when they graduate, you are going to have someone who is already a union member in one union joining your union who has met all of the same criteria you had to meet and is going to work alongside you. And I think that is something that gives teachers this sense of this is a program that is aligned with my interests on I want high quality people. And I define high quality as they're working in my building. I know them. I trust them. And they're going to get the same training that I had to be equipped for this job. I hate things that make me change my mind. Michael, <laughs> I, 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 I was going to say, if you have other suggestions for how to get Marco to change his mind on some of his preconceived <laughs> notions, I'm, you know, we'll have you back for some other topics. <laughs> So let's let's continue broadening this part of the conversation a bit. When we talked earlier about the reach belief on student-centered education, you told us a little bit about what that meant. So I, I think I know how you're going to answer this because you talked about your belief in technology as helping the teachers do their job rather than, I think, if I can put words into your mouth, rather than helping the kids learn specifically, it's helping the teachers do their job so they can teach the kids. But, you know, there's so much ed tech out there. Um, some is 
better than others. I forget the stat that I heard, but the number of different technologies and apps that school districts have is just staggering. I don't mean that are that they have available to them, but they actually buy. It's just many, many, many dozens, just sort of mind boggling number. Um, so can you envision some ed tech that drastically reduces the need for teachers? Like you got these 300,000 teacher equivalents that were missing. Can we supply some of that with tech or can we maybe make the average student teacher ratio not 15 but 25 without you know a loss of learning outcome or a loss of education quality is there is there a way to do this there is a way yeah and and so again let's go back to the history of how we got here because it used to be that we had a monopsony on female labor and and other like people of color etc if i was a woman there's only one place for me to go this is relevant i swear um <laughs> That meant that we could underpay teachers and get the best quality that we needed. And, and we've already talked about what that did for wages. There's a second order effect that also happened when women's rights and, and the civil rights movement broke out in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, which is that now women weren't choosing between being a stay-at-home mom or being a teacher. They had other options, right? They could go elsewhere. And so there was a reason why around that time women started leaving home and entering the workforce. And we saw not just like correlation, but direct causality of that led to us saying, okay, well, someone needs to do the job of the caretaker at home, right? Like someone needs to do that job. And so the easiest thing to do is to just take what was still the cheapest unit of labor, which was teachers, and you say, we're just going to make smaller teacher class sizes, right? One to 15 is going to be what we do. We're going to lower teacher ratios because teachers can now take on more of those pastoral duties at home. So that substitution effect is how we got to this place of having class sizes that are so much smaller than they'd ever been in history. Hmm. At the end of the day, if we want to relax that and we want to get back to arguing efficiency around, we need a teacher being able to do more with more students because we get paid on a per student basis. That's the way you create efficiency. If that's our thesis, then what we need to do is go in and unbundle those roles that were only recently bundled together. And so I think programs that, you know, there is the direct ed tech everybody thinks about of like personalized tutoring that uses an algorithm to give students high dosage tutoring, et cetera. Sure. Right. I have no objections to that. I would say those tools have existed for a while now, and we've yet to see a real ROI in terms of student outcomes at a systems level. And I would say it's because I don't think that's the rate limiting factor. I think technology that starts freeing up teachers from some of those other duties, automating phone calls homes to parent when a student is late for school, um, managing IEP reporting for special education. I think things that free up the teacher's labor on everything but the instruction is paradoxically the right ed tech for allowing us to do more with instruction. Because, because I think there are already good ed tech tools that a teacher could use to reach students more effectively and more efficiently, but not if it's still only 10% of their bandwidth because they're still busy making phone calls and filing reports and do everything else. Hmm. So I'd say if we were to fill out the, there's, there needs to be good ed tech as we traditionally think about it, that exists. Now our rate limiting factor are things that take up teachers' time and prevent them from effectively deploying that tech. And that's where we need to focus our attention. Hmm. Mallory, we are running out of time, unfortunately, because I, we'd love to keep this, this conversation going for a lot longer and hopefully we'll have you back. But uh, since I've been reinventing myself during this podcast, let me take the, the question that normally Michael takes towards the end, which is... Uh, Look ahead 15 years. You've mentioned the role of technology and what technology can do. We know that technology will change both how teachers can be trained, how teachers can do their jobs, and the jobs that will be available to students outside. And look ahead 15 years and tell, tell us, what do you think is very different 15 years from now? Are teachers paid better? Are they doing their jobs in a different way? Are they being trained in a different way? What does the whole ecosystem look like, say, about 15 years from now? Uh, is there what I think it will happen or what I hope will happen? Both. Okay. Because what I think we, we'd like to we'd like to think that what you hope will happen, you will make happen. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. So I think, and again, this is not because I'm a Luddite. It is not because I don't believe in technology, but I do think at its core, education is a human experience. And so my hope is that 15 years from now, We've invested in ed tech as a way of making teachers feel more empowered, more valued, and like they are resourced in the ways they need to do their job well. What that would look like is in 15 years, 
We have used technology in terms of how we train teachers so that you have high quality educators who are able to get a degree without taking on student loan debt, who then enter the classroom well-prepared and who are then compensated at market rate. And that we have used technology to create the efficiencies for that to be true. Like that is at the center of how students and and adults are working together to get those outcomes. And technology has been equipping that by creating more efficiencies that drive down costs in other sectors so that we can pay teachers more, charge less for their training, et cetera. That is my hope. And I think technology has huge potential there. For that to become the reality, I think we need to broaden our understanding of what is ed tech and what is the role that it has to play? Like we think ed tech is curriculum. And I think we have oversaturated the curriculum market. Every day I hear about a new curriculum company and that's great, but it's there's no marginal return on that. I think we need to broaden our understanding of ed tech to things like, like we spent last year somewhere around $7 billion on headhunting and teacher shortage fees. What if we had ended teacher shortages through these tools and technological efficiency around teacher training and placement and had 7 billion new dollars flowing into our schools that didn't have to be spent on something like recruitment, right? So I think if we can get better at expanding our frame on what technology, what education technology is and what it does, and we can then use that to drive resources back into classrooms. Do you think in this future 15 years from now, university-based teaching degrees are still mostly around? Are they still the norm? I think they will be around. I think there will be a question of whether or not they are the norm, right? Some people, like, I think some people could rightly make the argument of some students want four years on campus, right? They want to go to sororities and frat parties. They want to be on campus. And and that's, that's great. That's fine. The question is, is that the only way to find your way into the workforce? And so my, my theory and my hope is that they still exist, but rather than being how a hundred percent of our teachers are trained, there are 50% of how our teachers are trained. Yeah. Wonderful. Okay. Anything else you want to, you want to share with us before we let you go? This has been a a long one, but it's been great. Any, any other uh, comments you want to, you want to add? No, not officially. I I think that's great. (laughs) (laughs) Nothing on the record. (laughs) So Mallory Dwindle Palish of Reach University and Craft Education Systems. Thanks so much for joining us at M4Edge. Thank you.